you know, with with no drawings, all, all, all these cost of people and and uh, I remember in the canteen one day, I stood up one out. I was angry with them because uh, how can you how can you how can you make this without knowing what you're going to finish? Up? I said, how did you get that line along there where it goes along and goes down? And I, he said, well, it just turned out like that. So it was a bit it was a bit off, and uh, and we went right to. The end, well, we were there quite a number of months before uh, Ridley Scott came in, and uh, he wasn't quite happy. He was given this, um, and we had it on the forklift, forklift, and bringing it down in the picture. The action was okay, but Ridley sent this, and I made some hexagonal columns for another bit of the set, and he says, uh, pass one of them up. So I'm stood there with this column at the back end of the Nostromo. He said, yeah, he said, we'll have them there, two of them there. And it was just ad lib like that. So as it happened, because he thought it looked too short, which it did, you know, and he, he just come in, that was it, done. And we had another big, um, we made a big cutout instead of having the actual Nostromo coming into land and, and having to see all the lights up underneath. I think you, I think you was on this, weren't you? But all these lights. And uh, we spent quite an age doing it. And then really Scott came in and said, no, no, it's out. <laughs> and that, that was that, you know, so, uh, yeah. and I thought, well, you know, I can, can, we're in the waste making money game. And then afterwards um, I made, Made a smaller size um, for for mo little mobile shots, um, which uh, Brian Johnson wanted to make. So I made one up, but I made it solid, so we took casts off it. I think Martin Barr is the only one for Wigan, and I think he's uh, he's he he's got it all off, Pat, you know, and he's. That's all he seemed to think about, like, you know, and he, he'd sit there and I'd be a bit worried about him sniffing chloroform all the time because uh, he got, used to get so uh, involved with it, but it, it, he turned him out so fast. And uh, his, he, and on uh, Space 999, he did, he did models on that. And they, they were the foreground models, uh, far better than what the employed with him because he he was on that on sort of job by job you know so uh, I think he probably was learning the ropes and through that probably probably wised him up a bit I think mm. yeah well the vibes I got was um well I, so, I was suddenly the oldest one on the job instead of the uh, instead of plenty of being older than me that was 1999 and Alien was the first two where I, I think I was probably the oldest and uh, that made me realise that I was uh, how old I was sort of thing because they were all young chaps then and uh, and, and up, up until then I was uh, I, I always looked at myself as being young. <laughs> yeah. Well Alien to me was just like a lot of young chaps doing doing a fun job but uh, Alien was a very relaxed very very relaxed thing for everybody it was um, it might have given people a false idea of how uh, the film industry was I think because it was uh, it was a fun game really <laughs> We sure do, and uh, here's a message for all you aliens out there. Just a quick reminder, it ain't your world, it's a man's, man's, man's world.
Rolled into Bray Studios for a drink, bumped into Brian Johnson. Ah, you're back, says good old Brian. When do you finish? I said, we, we've finished. Right, start Monday, two picture deal, Alien and Empire Strikes Back. And nobody's ever said anything like that again in my life. You know, I, I'm looking for multiple deals, left, right and centre, and they never come off. And that's how it started. Really simple. Um, obviously, my involvement mainly was wiring up the um, panels for Nostromo. It was an amazing set, the, the bridge of Nostromo, in as much as every button actually did something. Might not be the right thing, mm. now that people know spaceships inside out, but at least it lit something up. At about 6, 6.30 every evening on main unit, all the producers would turn up and stand there and look and talk and uh, the, the basic reason being that they would like the unit to wrap within reasonable time uh, to avoid running into overtime payments and things and of course Ridley bless him would just carry on shooting regardless <laughs> and it would be oh 11 o'clock or, or whatever and just enough time to get home and have some sleep and come back and do it all another day but it was great fun and it, it was I don't know, you see, you hear things. People, when we all started back in the 70s, you had our elders saying, God, it's not what it used to be, this film industry. You know, we've had the good days. And here are we saying, it's not what it used to be. We've had the good days. So what the next generation are going to do, I don't know. <laughs> but it was the film, really, the chess burster. Um, the rest of the artists uh, did not like the special effects department after this. I think it would be quite fair to say. Uh, John Hurt was the only person who knew what was going on. And we had a split table. John sitting in a chair, leaning back, and a false chest on him and false legs. He had a while well, we, well, he was being set up, he had a glass of red wine on the table beside him and was probably smoking his uh, Gulwar cigarettes or whatever they were. Um, he was rigged up with the chest burster and when it came to the filming of it, I was given a little task by a certain Mr Alder. Uh, I, little did I realise that it would make the actors really dislike me for a few minutes. I was in control of the valve on the, with the blood. And it was a container about that diameter and about that height, put a bit higher, pressurised with the theatrical blood in it. Um, Dave Watkins had been to Sippenham's Slaughterhouse and purchased their freshest offal of the day. It was all dressed into the chest cavity. And when the little monster came out, uh, I got my tap on the shoulder, opened the valve, and gallons of this stuff shot out all over the set. Veronica Cartwright was sitting literally, instead of sitting on the seat, she was sitting up on the backrest and got about a pint of it in her face and just went straight over the back onto the floor. Harry Dean Stanton, uh, I think, copped a fair amount of blood and staggered to the back wall of the set and promptly was rather sick. Uh, and I, I think if they could have killed us, they would have at that point, because it was a one-off shot. They had not been told what was going to happen and how bloody it was going to be. But it was it was brilliant. And yeah, I think just turning that valve on, that, that, that was probably one of the little personal highlights. <laughs> Other than the fact I actually liked the people, if one had not got on with any of them, it would have been an absolute bonus. But that was a great shot, great cinema. Yeah. I, I think what made it totally memorable to me was the fact that the relationship between the special effects department and the actors and actresses involved, that we'd go down to pub lunchtime with them, and in fact, at the end of the picture, there was uh, they held a party up in London as all the 
American um, Sigourney Weaver, Harry Dean Stanton, Yafik Kota. Um, we were all invited up there uh, for a Mexican evening and all the girls went in the kitchen and cooked the chili con carne and uh, a great evening was had by one and all. There, there was a non-film person there by the name of Art Garfunkel who seemed a bit under the weather that he'd made it down the hallway as far as the bottom of the stairs and seemed to spend most of the evening holding on to the newel post that I can only assume that had he removed his arms he'd have probably collapsed and fallen over. The reasoning or the cause of this, I do not know. <laughs> At the end of the picture, and especially when we went to uh, the crew showing of it, uh, and realised that there, there was literally a monster movie there, and seeing the way it took off with, with the cinema going public, it was just a great feeling to realise that you've been lucky enough to be part of the crew on the thing. And uh, my sincere thanks to Brian Johnson and Nicky Alder for having me uh, on the thing. As I'm sure my uh, colleagues would probably say the same. But no, it, it was great. And from the point of view of... I, th I think what made it extra special was the effects department relationship with the uh, acting department that was really great, just like one big family. Brian was, I, he, the thing about him was it, uh, it was so nice, he gave me so much freedom. I've actually, in the last 30 odd years since doing all this stuff, I've never had as much freedom as Brian gave me. I didn't work on Nostromo until Ron Hone had actually built, we had a carpenter, and he built uh, in skin ply and tuba one and tuba two and what have you. He built a sort of basic frame of Nostromo. And then we had a couple of, I think it was Simon Deering and uh, John Packenham. They, that, I think they and somebody else clad the whole of Nostromo in 20,000 plastic card. Right, so that we could then come along and stick little bits over it. But what I got put onto was doing the refinery, because Bill Pearson was on it as well as uh, with me, and we knew each other anyway. Um, and Bill had done a, an initial spire-like gantry, you know, being tall things about five foot high. Um, but I was told that we needed another three of these. So basically, I just set to. I basically made it up as I went along. I mean, I seem to have this ability to sort of, I've always been able to visualize without having to do many drawings. I can kind of see what in my mind, which is, it's just lucky really. And I can remember vividly, um, Ron built the platform again out of plywood and two, two built one and what have you. But Nick Alder made a metal frame for it. Like he made a metal frame for Nostromo as well. Um, but I can remember we had to cover the top and bottom of the platform with 16th inch thick perspex. And I can remember me and Martin Gant, remember Martin Gant? I can remember the two of us up there with this Yoo-Hoo, you know, Evo stick, paint all this Evo stick on and go, hey man, this is really good. Well, you know, this is really good. And we covered the whole of this thing. And I can just remember, you know, and we, cause we put it down and we had to put it down exactly right if you didn't you're gonna get the darn thing off again you know and we anyway we covered it and i think he did more than i did and then i moved in and started adding all this detail and of course finished it all and we started shooting on it and we had a yellow nostromo which by now we'd all finished and ridley came to bray studios and it was like a hurricane hit the place and he said right and he'd go around and look at all the different models and I'd sort of explaining things. And it's nice blow, you know, he, he, he was he was saying, what, what, you know, this. And I said, well, you know, the, the, the brief that I was given was it had to have these spires and things. And he sort of said, well, we're not having any of you know, that stuff. And he picked up a chisel. I remember him picking up a, a mallet and a chisel. And he said, he said, you don't mind if I do a bit of work, do you? Or something like that, you know, with his, his northeast accent. And he started whacking bits off of it. And I'm going, oh, you know, that was six weeks work. 
and all these literally people think i'm exaggerating but you, you probably remember it he, he knocks all these pieces off and he says right all that detail there that's like three weeks work cover that over with a sheet of perspex with loads and loads of grid lines on it so what we'd have to do would get a piece of three eighth inch thick perspex and run it across the circular saw crisscrossing it to make these really complicated sort of crisscross sets of lines and then cover over the detail that we'd spent all this de all this time on with all these pieces of perspex so that's really you know redoing the whole thing of course because we'd shot it all with spires and now we had this thing which i must admit fitted the story better so ridley's obviously quite right although it was obviously a bit of a shame covering up that detail he had his own ideas and essentially he shot the whole thing again because he came to nostromo and then we started spraying it and one sort of sweep of the normal primer grey, we thought it's no good. And I remember going down to some shop in Maidenhead and buying a massive amount of zinc plate primer. And we found first we did a test with we, somebody, I, I don't know who it was, got had some zinc plate primer and what it was you could spray it on, I don't know if you remember, it was darker and it would polish up. And looked like metal, really looked like metal. So Nostromo wasn't grey primer as so many people today, you know, are all, people are always asking me questions about what it, what colour it was. It was actually this dark grey colour, polished up, and, and then we obviously we shaded it and worked on it. And it, so, so it's kind of all, all the model work in Alien, it just, it, it, evolution. It was like an evolution, you know, of, of different ideas which ended up with some f actually very good effects. Um, I can remember Dennis coming in and saying, um, oh, I've got an idea for putting some like gunge on it. And you had a can of um, spray glue. Now, I don't know what it's actually for. I think it's sticking carpets down or something, but yeah. he, he started spraying it on the detail. And we're kind of going, I'm not sure about this because this looks like we've got like saliva running down all over the ship. But we, I think, as far as I recall, we only did a little bit of that, and then that idea sort of got forgotten because it did look a bit, yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, great days. So we had this this wonderful driver, Joe. I can't remember his surname. Joe be, Gates. Joe Gates. <clears throat> Joe Gates. He won't be with us anymore now. And Joe Gates, he used to sit there and I'd say, Joe, can you just take all the bits off? And I can remember him with like these huge piles of boxes that Bill and I had gone out and bought, including 200 space shuttles, which we really did get 200 space shuttles, and take them apart. And dear old Joe Gates breaking all these pieces off and sitting on the end and said, I'm oh, moaning was just jokingly, because he's a lovely bloke. And he said, he said, I didn't come here to pick plastic bits off. I came, I'm the driver. I said, well, I know you're not driving now, though, I? <laughs> oh. I was sent over uh, by Nick Alder to Pinewood Studios. They virtually finished shooting and the the the, Nos, the the Nos the Narcissus was hanging in the studio roof and it was like as if the set had been squashed so that Ridley could shoot it directly from the back and it would look fine on screen but it was actually squashed probably in half. And I, I photographed it extensively from every angle so to get all the detail the same. Then I went back to Bray and I did some, I did a little sketch this little sort of doodle which I've still got and showed it to Ridley Scott because he was now at Bray and I said um, I sort of foresee it something like that and he said well Ron Cobb's done a drawing of it but you couldn't see it and it was completely different to what they'd made it's had four engines and essentially it was roughly the same shape but it's much more rounded and, they, and I said well I've come up with this which I could do in plastic and obviously covering little bits and pieces and he just said yeah do it just like that, you know, um, and I clad, clad that with quarter inch perspex, about was that four or five mil perspex, um, and just made this diamond shaped ship and had to make little sections that could be pulled out.